Hi everyone, my name is André. I'm the founder of a small company called Scalabit. Um, Scalabit is about one year old. We focus mainly on automation, so we help customers to drive CI CV. That's basically our core business. And of course, when driving a value stream mapping, we find gaps and then sometimes use the cloud basically to just um, yeah, use the power of the cloud to be able to, to, to have faster feedback. It was talked a lot about Dave Farley and I completely agree with it. The talk is a bit provocative. It's called pushing the limits using cloud. I'll give some examples of the things that we are doing. I find it uh, pretty cool. Just stop me at any time. Um, testing in real life. So I'm not allowed to say the, number, the name of the customer, but I can say that he's one of the biggest uh, uh, manufacturer of lithography machines in the world. A hot topic nowadays with the ship war and everything that is happening around Taiwan. And these guys have very, very expensive machines. So if you talk about these, this thing is way more complex than a, than a space shuttle, I can tell you. And this thing is pretty, pretty cool, pretty expensive. And if in a clean room this is down, the customer is losing about, for sure, more than 10,000K per hour. So it's pretty expensive that the reliability of these things needs to be pretty high. How do they test in real life? So um, this is not a shiny application with all the microservices that you hear in the books. Welcome to reality. Things are different. People, uh, we hire bad software engineers, we hire good software engineers, and at the end you end up with a big monolith that is only able to run on the top of a specific VM. And there are no microservices, they're just one application. But that does a fantastic job, by the way. But this is reality. There are thousands of companies like that. And it's a pity that we don't talk about these things and that we only hear about the good one. Well, not the good ones, but the, the shiny architectures because these things are practical and exist in the world and we, have, we still have to help these companies. Huh? So organizations grow pretty fast, especially when they are successful. Suddenly, there were 30,000 people. Suddenly, no buildings were left, so they really needed to expand. And from that 30,000 people, they have about 5K doing software engineers, so 5K software engineers. They had a room in a dark place called the data center, and there they had a, a bunch of virtual machines that were able to serve these software engineers. So we were talking about 2,000 virtual machines for 5K engineers. And you say, but Andre, you just said 65,000 uh, uh, virtual machines are required to, to qualify. So what's happening? Well, we would put pe people on queues. That's what happens. If you wanted to test something on your CI, you would need to go to a queue and wait. And this is a pressure business where is, there is always a project leader knocking at your back saying, when is it ready? Well, you don't know because you don't even know your place in the queue. You don't have a ticketing system. So it's really unpredictable when you talk about CI. So what you ended up is like this. This is just a graph, an example. These are the same amount of test cases. This is a scale in minutes. And basically, these guys were completely unpredictable. They will run the same set of use cases in one hour. On the next minute, of course, they will go to a queue and then bump, go up. Then maybe no one is in the queue. Again, uh, a decent time, and so on and so forth. So it was really, really unpredictable. And then Dave Farley was visiting us. I had the pleasure of spending a full week with him, really nice. And then he said, hey, you know there is this thing called cloud. It's infinite, right? You can try it, you can abuse from it. You just have a big credit card and it will go. But you are able to use it. You have enough computation on cloud. And we thought, well, that's really a good idea. It can go multi-region. They keep all of this for us. Oh, really nice. Why don't we use it? And that's we did our first prototype. And then it really pays off. This is our, the same test request, as I mentioned before, running on cloud, as the versus on-prem. Whoa, they are predictable now. Nice. Let's go forward with this. This is the approach that we need to follow. So, because we don't have a marketeer working in our team, we call it cloud test, obvious, right? 
So we started with the product called Cloud Test and how does Cloud Test work? Just to give you some context and a bit more of the meat in the bones. It's a CLI tool. The engineer can call it from the pipeline, from, the, from his Unix terminal. And basically you pass a baseline, which is the current version of the software that you want to, to, to test. You have a patch. The patch is just an RPM with your latest changes. And you pass what we call test scenarios. Test scenario is just an application that defines in an XML tag what are the steps, bash scripting, that you can execute inside of a, a virtual machine. And then we do all the shabang from you. So we start uh, processing all these. We see uh, the amount of, uh, we extract all the required information from the test, like what is the amount of virtual machines that we need to create, which type of virtual machines we need to create. We start splitting all the scenarios to optimize for parallelization because users would say, oh, this test, they of course would abuse from a virtual machine when it's a precious resource before. So when they would have one, they would just execute thousands of tests in the same VM just to optimize because now they got the locked in. Now we optimize, we split, we try to basically parallelize as much as we can. Then we start creating VMs. We have some, we use Google Cloud, by the way. So we start using uh, uh, the Google Cloud API, the single and the batch re requests will go there. Then we start running, the machines are autonomous, they will start running their tests and so on. And at a certain point they report back, then we clean the environment, we report to the user done, good, move on, next request comes. So that's basically how it looks. You can stop me at any time. So how does, any questions? No. So how does it work with processing a request? Of course, we see all these nice videos on YouTube about nice architecture, so we try to implement one. Um, and indeed, we have a bunch of microservices. We, it is a Kubernetes uh, 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 meetup. We started with Kubernetes, but then we ran away from Kubernetes. I'm sorry. Uh, the reason is that we really wanted, uh, we didn't want to maintain a Kubernetes cluster, so we went completely serverless. For us, it pays off. We are a very small team. We don't have time to be managing all this stuff. And it's cheaper. Um, so we have a bunch of microservices running, and I'll just very fast explain the flow. So we just, the user sends something to a, to a, to a, to a bucket in Google Cloud. We get the pub sub. The pub sub will create, will, will, it, uh, we have a cloud function that is subscribed to this pub sub. The pub sub will send a request to what we call Eleanor. If you know Eleanor comes from the 60 minutes, that's the, the 60 was the goal to have a really fast test in one hour. And then uh, we start basically creating VMs, again using PubSubs, a complete uh, asynchronous architecture. And then VM started to be creating by the, by the cloud function that does this. Then we had a, a, what we call a dev bench, which is basically a compute engine, a VM running. And then we check if the data center of Google worked properly, because I can tell that most of the times it doesn't work. And then VMs are running, we are fine, we can go to the next step. Then when the VM starts executing the test, at the end of executing the test, the VM will just report back every time. So it just sends, again, uh, sub, it, it sends data to the bucket so that the user, if he wants to diagnose him some information, he can see the information inside of the bucket. Um, it sends a PubSub again to notify that uh, what is the test result, if it passed or if it failed. Then we update the test request with the result of the VM passing. Then we update our Firestore, just saying, okay, this, uh, this, v, this, this test passed. And we terminate the VM. And then we are done, always using a synchronous uh, and a lot of pub subs for ensuring um, that the system can scale like expected. So this is an example. You see the command line, very ugly. Queue something, bad naming because we don't queue. <laughs> then we pass a timeout because sometimes you can imagine that test should just hang. So we need to kill the test request, otherwise it's just burning the credit card. Every time, a customer doesn't really like it. Um, you pass a baseline that you want, you pass the patch, it starts doing all of this, and then you get a very fancy uh, <laughs> web page with the test results that the user can, can see. Very raw, very practical, up to the point, 
no bullshit, just run the test, give me the results and move on. Maybe a bit about the technology. We use a lot of Terraform, so we manage all our infrastructure as code. We use a lot of Go uh, code. We use GitHub, sorry for that. There's someone from uh, Circle CI here today. <laughs> we do multiple fully automated deployments per day. So we really deploy into production to our customers without them even noticing what is happening. Uh, follow the principle, we just deploy, deploy, deploy as we go. At, we are all deploying in Europe West 4 for uh, re regulation reasons, but I will go there. And because I forgot something, I just wanted to mention something. Remember this, on this architecture, we create virtual machines. And then this is what we call the control plane, because this is basically controlling with the status of, an all, of the whole request, but this is the execution unit. This is where the VMs are running. So then we do, like I mentioned, uh, multi we do a lot of, depo the deployments are all in Europe West 4, and we are a team of six engineers. So we really need to move fast in order to fulfill this. We use the pattern of a SaaS service internally. So we deploy, we have one team, one project, one team, one project. This is also for a, a, a scalability reasons. Who from here knows what is a quota in cloud? In Google Cloud a quota? Okay, I will explain it, that also. And then we have about 90 plus execution Google Cloud projects where we deploy per team. And then we have a data project. Well, our developers really like it, as you can imagine, right? So you see the graph. This is basically the tendency of the amount of requests that we got per month. And this is the amount of VMs per month. So we are currently about creating about 10 million virtual machines per month. This is the scale that we are talking about. So if something goes wrong, indeed, we have a metric system in place to tell us. Well, when you do this and you get the feedback, when the engineers really like the feedback, they start being smart about it. So they use it and abuse it, right? And the first thing that they notice is the billing model of GCP. In GCP, you basically pay the same for one VM running for 60 minutes or six VMs running for 10 minutes. So what our engineers started to doing is basically optimizing for parallelization. They don't care, they get the same billing and a faster feedback, so why don't we try to split everything and to run it fast? And when you do this, you really start reaching the scalability levels of what, is a, what, what happens on cloud. Things start getting pretty busy everywhere. Eh? So we had basically two issues, capacity and quota management, and we have quota issues with bandwidth. Because most of you weren't, didn't raise your hand, maybe you're too shy or you simply don't know, but a quota is basically a soft break in a cloud provider. If by mistake you say, I want to spin up 1 million VMs, the cloud provider puts a quota and says, for this project, we only allow you to spin up 100 VMs. So that by mistake, if you do something, then you will get a big bill. So the cloud provider always tries to, to, to slow things down. So first problem, very simple, very easy to explain. We are doing CI in high, in high scale, right? So this is really high scale. But I cannot control the behavior of my users. We have spiky workloads. So sometimes the user says, I'm going to test something now. But other times of the day, especially during the night, is pretty flat. And what you see here is a graph where basically this is the limit of CPUs that we had over time. And if, if you see the sum of the max of CPUs that we could use for this particular uh, project, you see that we went a lot of times above the quota. And what happens if you go above the quota? In our case, our application will put the request on a queue. So we were implementing sort of a queue because of the quota management. We discussed it multiple times this with Google, and they were having a lot of trouble explaining this to the capacities team inside of Google. So the guys that are really managing the data center. Why? Because we would go to them and say, we need more quota. But then they would look at the average and say, why? You're always at 40%. Why do you need more quota? And then we say, yeah, but we hit the quota limits a bunch of times. 
And they say, yeah, that's your problem. You have to manage that. But the problem is that you need to build. What happened? I think you removed the cable or something. No. You reached no? The I reached the presentation limit. I get out of quota, yeah. I see. Oh. You should raise the limit. Yeah, you should raise the limit. Yeah, so where was I? Here. So we had a lot of issues convincing Google that we had a quotation. Suddenly the customer support team said, you know what, we are going to send you two engineers to work with you guys just to specifically solve that problem. So the first thing we thought was, Okay, let's try to solve um, quote. We also had quota issues with downloading. So the first thing that we thought, okay, let's solve this. Meaning downloading, just to give you an example of the problem, <laughs> means that we, at the certain point, were downloading things from a bucket at 1.5 terabytes per second, which made them really nervous at a certain point. We got a call from SRE at Google saying, hey guys, what are you doing? It's weird. Uh, <laughs> But it's obvious, right? Because when you spin up a VM, if that VM needs a specific tool, it needs to download the tool. We are spinning up 10,000 VMs with one, G one GB per tool. You reach this, we are paralyzing everything. So again, a problem of scalability that we never thought about. This is pretty impressive. This is 500 times the, the network card that, for instance, I have in my, in my PC. So what we did basically was, okay, let's split for multiple regions multiple zones, because we never did that from the beginning. Rookie mistake. Then what happens is that we started basically saying, okay, instead of just running the VMs in one, in one region, we'll run in multiple regions, and then we download. But this has a problem, because when you download from the same region, it's free. But when you start downloading from different regions, you have to pay. Yeah. So, it turned out that for us, it was cheaper just to replicate all the data in all the regions, having the same buckets everywhere, than just paying for the traffic that was happening around all the different regions. So this was one of the, the problems that we had to solve. Yeah, but it's weird, Andre, because you started with quota and, and spiky, but this doesn't really solve the spiky problem of the workloads. And you're right. We still had this. So, because even if we would have running in different regions, we would still have quota issues regarding the amount of uh, virtual machines being created. Then we come up with what we call a resource pool concept. With the help of Google, we implemented this. And then, what's the idea? Instead of having a fixed pool of projects to run the VMs, why don't we just create a pool of projects where all the VMs are running and we balance all the work that is being done on the control plane instead of spinning up VMs on this control plane, why don't we just have a pool of workers available in multiple regions that can scale on demand and then we just say, okay, this request comes, go to this pool, this request comes, goes to this pool. Indeed, what uh, happens with doing this is that we balance the load. Instead of having spiky loads every time in one single project, now we balance and we, like I mentioned before, we had a 40% average load on the system. By making the runner's project, we just grouped everything and now we are always on that average. And every time that we need something, we just measure Look and see, A, hey, we are reaching now levels of 60%. Please, Google, give us more capacity on this region. Create another project on this resource pool. And that's how it works. So basically, we move it. The control plane still remains on, the, on per project, per team. But now we have multiple runner projects that are running in different regions and just uh, running VMs in different places of the world as we want. Conclusion, I think I went pretty fast. Conclusion is go immediately multi-region, uh, especially when you want to scale because scaling is pretty hard. And the other thing is that scaling is hard. I don't have any special advice for you. The only advice that I have is that every day we, fi we find a new problem. And uh, it's a constant fight to try to balance between everything, but uh, this is basically the work that we have done. 
That's it. Questions? Thank you, Andre. Any question for Andre? No questions, everything's uh, clear. One there. Can you please? Uh, hello, yeah, it's a very short one. Um, what made you choose Google Cloud as yeah. a provider? It's also a very short one answer in my side. We tried first Azure because we were forced by our IT. It didn't work. Okay. The VM doesn't boot because it doesn't have the, the drivers to, to, to boot on Azure. And then we just fall back for our GCP. It uh, works perfectly fine on GCP because GCP is based on Camu, which is basically the same virtualization as we use on our own data center. We also try AWS. Also works pretty nice in AWS. Um, given the amount of VMs that we create and the challenges that we have, we still kept uh, Google Cloud, even there are some advantages in AWS. But from the rough calculation, I think it will be, we thought it's cheaper, also giving all the reputation to run it on Google Cloud. Makes sense. But that's, that's very easy to, to yeah. answer. <laughs> cool, thank you. Uh, you mentioned HashiCorp Terraform as part of the stack. Is the uh, license change from HashiCorp, is that a problem somehow for this project? No. No, if we need, we'll pay for it. We are pretty happy with the stack, and uh, I see all the discussion around it, but for us, it's still okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, so I'm now curious, how do you use Terraform? Is that how you deploy the VMs? No. The VMs are fully created using, uh, using Go and the Google Cloud API provided by Go. What we use Terraform is basically, let's go to the slide. Oh, too fast, sorry. What we use Terraform for is to create mostly the static things. So mm. buckets, uh, service accounts, um, uh, pub subs, all of these more static things are basically created with Terraform. We use Go Releaser to make all our uh, containers available and we push to the registries of Google Cloud and then we deploy also using Terraform by mapping to that container that specific version. And a nice thing that we, I think also we do and Terraform really helps on that is the uniformity about the, the product. So you deploy one single product in multiple projects, all of, them, all of that done with Terraform, and the only thing that you change is basically the name of the project. The rest is all the same, and the service account to deploy, of course, but then it just goes pretty smooth. That's why we use a lot of Terraform for this. Okay. Uh, and may I ask as well, um, why use VMs and not just Docker containers or like pretty good, pods? Pretty good question. Um, this thing is um, um, a heavy thing. Uh, it uh, requires about 350 GBs of disk space. We did convert, Google has technology for this, to convert VMs to containers, but um, it ends up in a, not a win-win situation because then your Kubernetes cluster or the platform where you would need to run basically would only be able to run one container itself because that thing is so heavy and you cannot, share vol you cannot share a disk between uh, the VMs. They really need to be attached. That's how the application is done. So we end I wish we could go to containers and because, of course, would solve a lot of the problems that we have, especially the billing. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but, but indeed, we, we, we cannot. Also, the time it takes to, to fetch the container, uh, it's so heavy that doesn't pay off. It's just better to go to a VM and use the VM. Uh, if I can ask one more. Yeah. Um, wasn't it a lot of extra costs going from on-premise to cloud? Even though you got a lot of yeah, performance. You we, we always have that discussion internally, and uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion about it, especially our build is not something that I'm proud of. <laughs> uh, 
On the other hand, I still believe that the price of ironing is cheaper than the price of a human being. And I think that developers waiting for feedback is way more expensive than uh, spinning up a VM and paying some cents. We also did the rough cost estimation about what is the price on-prem and what was the price on Google Cloud, and it was almost the same. So there was not really a, a, a big difference in that sense. I think that even Google Cloud with discounts and right now it doesn't go down that often, but with prices going uh, down at the time, it would still be cheaper. But maintaining a data center is also pretty expensive and pretty difficult because doing, these guys are experts doing this. We are not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, yeah, I, I was wondering um, how, how did you manage to, um, to build up the architecture with the, um, the, um, all the, the cloud services and... Uh, Trial and error. Sorry? Trial and error, uh, okay. so basic... And, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and the, in that process, um, since this is... Uh, uh, uses a lot of uh, different services on the cloud. Um, how do you catch bugs? How do you manage that? A lot of metrics, I assume. Um, but what are your uh, insights, let's say? Yeah, so uh, we, when we started, we were, we were by far not experts on this. So we also had uh, an assignment from someone from, from Google professional services to work with us at the time. They did some help on especially on the scaling of the because the proof of concept was pretty easy to do but when you want to scale yeah. the architecture completely changes um, and we were very picky from the beginning so we did never took shortcuts in that sense so all our application is pretty well tested um, we can deploy pretty fast our pipeline runs in about one hour uh, we, we, we were very picky since the beginning everything was infrastructure as code and then we had also fantastic users that complain a lot and reach out to us when they see things are not okay. So that also helps a lot because the best metric that you have is your customer. <laughs> Sometimes you don't even see things happening and they are immediately reaching out to us saying, hey, this is, doesn't look okay, what do you think it is? But it was basically, we, ne we never started with this. Like I said, we started with basically with a Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. And then we notice ah, this is standing still most of the times. The execution part is really this. This is the core of the product. Okay. And then we said, okay, maybe going serverless give us less, less uh, uh, pain points. We went and it went pretty well. But it just grew organically as we were learning. There's no secret, it's just trial and error. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I think it was a question over there, yeah. So um, my question is, why did you decide to use the Google um, Cloud Platform from region, the Europe West 4? Uh, the customer is located in Europe West 4, okay. and there was some uh, regulations at the time that were forcing us to use Europe West 4. So uh, yeah, that was the main reason. Question. Two questions? Uh, you can speak up. I can hear you. Just because of the recording. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned the time out, time out in case a VM like hangs. Uh, we can also see the terminate VMs, but and something called by what? <laughs> but for um, there's a low probability, high impact scenario, like a catastrophic scenario where for some whatever reason these layers doesn't uh, work and you end up having like, you know, it already happened. large scale VMs <laughs> running like in an expensive bill. So how yeah. you can prevent that? With we have a lot of alerts about the average number of VMs over time. So we measure that and we profile it. So we know exactly when things are going up and down. We get a lot of alerts when we have long standing steel VMs. We also measure that. Um, and we have a, a, a really a, a hard deadline. No VM can be active for more than 24 hours. So 
that's our hard deadline. We don't support more than 24 hours. So in the worst case, you will need to pay for the 24 hours, but we have pretty good uh, metrics measuring what is happening inside of the system and really picking up if something is going wrong or not. So yeah. And, but it, it, sometimes it happens because we also sometimes make mistakes on the metrics. We don't see exactly, we don't put it correctly. So we, we see this sometimes. Also things like you, you don't, very tricky things is like, for instance, imagine that we do a bug in the create VM microservice and then suddenly it starts creating two, three VMs instead of one. We also have something called the health check that is constantly checking the system versus our state the database to know if things are okay in pair but the system is pretty dynamic it's 10 million vms per month right so you cannot measure in one point and then do the calculation and know again in the next point so there's always an error but that's that's the best we can try to do the other Question. one was no oh. i can take it Uh, did you try any sort of caching uh, to reduce that network transfer? Um, we tried. Maybe, maybe we were not that smart now if I look back. But um, so the user, uh, the user uses the bucket to extract tools, basically. And we have some custom tools, for instance. And you're right, we could always cache the bucket and put the sum tools immediately with the VM instead of downloading the whole time. We could also make a snapshot out of the VM and use that, that snapshot based on the, on, on the request. But it's so dynamic that makes it pretty hard to do. We also measure the time of making a snapshot to then create a VM image and then from the VM in image create instances. It's pretty slow, which would slow down the processing. And this change that I mentioned here, I can tell you the numbers. We are spending more now with the extra thing on the bucket. We spend like 2K per month. That's nothing on the billing that we are talking about. Yeah. That's peanuts. It doesn't even okay. goes in the graph. <laughs> yeah.